Derek Harper. Well, I'm more than Derek Harper. I'm a very excited Derek Harper, mainly because I'm starting my uh, my own podcast. Uh, it's going to be Harp's Court. Uh, going to touch on a lot of different things, of course, on the court. We're going to be all over the court itself, but we're also going to dive into some things off of the court. I think when you're given a platform, it's important for you to use versatility and talk about a variety of different topics when it comes to sports. And I think that's what's going to separate this show from from a lot of shows that are out there, a lot of podcasts out there. And um, I, I'm just really excited to uh, to have the opportunity to venture into having my own podcast. We all want to have a voice, and the opportunity has it presented itself. So I'm going to go for it. And I am ecstatic to have you, Mike Reiner. Everybody knows you, you, you don't need a big intro introduction in the Metroplex. Everybody knows who you are and what you've accomplished in this, in the Maverick uh, fold or in the, in the Metroplex in general. You, you've been absolutely tremendous. You're an old friend. I've known you for a long time. A couple of months ago, I came on your show. Yes, you did. Which was an honor and a lot of fun. So I, I'm grateful, and I really appreciate you taking the time to... Uh, to come and hang out with me. And, you know, I, I'm starting with the NBA Finals, which is going on right now, 1-1 Boston and Golden State, a, uh, a, a, a series that I think will go seven games. It, it's, uh, it's set up for that. Two different teams, two different styles as teams. You know, they say styles make fights right. and all of that. This is a great series for a lot of different reasons. What do you think, Mike? What, what has stood out to you after two games in the playoffs? Well, one thing that stood is both of these teams are really, really good. Mm. This is one time where you got the finals, and there are no imposters here. <laughs> right. I mean, the, these two teams, I don't know if the Warriors are the best in the West. I don't know. There's, there's some teams that could have something to say about that. But they won the tournament. They won the Western tournament. Now they're here. So... We are left to make what we can and will of that. Now, the Celtics, on the other hand, they were there, you know, riding high in the East for the better mm -hmm. part of the year. Especially the very, second half of the season. Yeah, 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 especially the second half. That's, I mean, they were just kind of lumbering along there for a while, but mm -hmm. in the second half, they really got hot. Yes. And when they got hot, they were virtually impossible to beat. The Warriors still have a lot of guys who were there in their halcyon days, which was, you know, just a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And those guys still have a lot left. I'm kind of liking the Warriors to win this thing. Mm -hmm. But I think the Celtics definitely belong, and I think we're in for some really, really good basketball. Well, we can put some friendly wages on it as good as the Warriors are and that they've been great coaching staff, Steve Kerr. Uh, Mike Brown, just, just guys, to your point, Mike, that have been there and done that. Yes. So you, you would think from that perspective, it would give them somewhat of an advantage. But I lean with Boston because the second half of the season, they were the best defensive team in the league. Yeah. And I've seen them get punched in the mouth and fall down, stagger a little bit, right? Yeah. But because of that defensive mindset, they have been able to bounce back. They've shown a lot of resiliency yeah. when it comes to having that ability to rebound and continue to fight. And to me, that's what the finals are all about. I mean, and you're going to have some highs and some lows. They find a way to uh, to come back. And that's why I'm going with the Celtics. And make no mistake, I'm not married to right, the right, Warriors' right. idea. Don't have a horse in the race. Because <laughs> both of these teams, like I said earlier, are really, really good. And you can see things going a certain way for mm -hmm. either of them. And that's another thing. You get into a tournament like this, there are going to be times when it just comes down to the bounce of the ball. Mm -hmm. Something working out for somebody, not for somebody else. And who knows? Something like that could decide this thing. I still like the Warriors because I like their experience. Yes. And I like the, the way they've worked in their new guys. Mm, great you know, point. I really do like the way they've worked in their new guys. And, and they seem to have a really, really nice chemistry. A lot of the time when you have that kind of transition, you lose some of that. Mm -hmm. And to me, it doesn't look like they have. What do you think about that? Well, I, it's a great point. And, and I think one of the things that's missed when you start talking professional sports, period, is the developmental part of it. San Antonio, when you talk 
the NBA has always had an ability to develop guys. They draft guys in the second round, but yeah. their program and how they grow guys and help guys to improve and, and, and grow as players, I think is second to none. The Golden State Warriors, to your point, they've done a tremendous job of that, and that's part of the reason why they've struggled for a year or two, but then they're right back in the yeah, mix. Yeah. And I, I, I think, like I said, I don't think many people understand how important that piece is. Dallas is starting to get it. Uh, God Sham God is an assistant coach for the Mavericks. Mm -hmm. Great work when it comes to developing guys, offensive minded, defensive minded, j just the whole nine yards. And that, that in itself can keep you relevant for a long time, in my opinion. As a team, as a player, you know, Pop's still coaching because Manu Ginobili drafted, I think, in the second round. Nobody knowing who this guy guy is coming from Argentina. Yeah. But develop, develop, continue to get better as a player. And the Spurs won, what, five championships, because, large part because of their pro, their farm league, how they, they, they find a way to uh, develop players. Been a lot of talk in this finals about physicality. And, you know, I, I played in the in the old era where a fight was not a big deal <laughs> in professional sports. Right. And um, what, what do you th how, how do you read all of that? Draymond Green getting a lot of press for being overzealous on the floor, things of that nature. How, how, how do you feel about all of that? Well, if I were a coach, Draymond Green would just drive me nuts. Right. If he I wasn't think. on your team. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, even if he was on my team, I think he'd drive me, drive yeah, me nuts. Because, good <laughs> because, I mean, he, he flirts with being thrown out of every game he's in. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I guess he's one of those guys who has an understanding of just how far he, he can, can push go. it. Yes. And knows where it stops and starts. And if he's got that much self-control, <laughs> which a lot of the time it looks like he doesn't, but if, if he does, then more power to him. But to your point of the physical nature of this thing, yeah, it, it, I mean, it's very, very physical. I mean, I, I, it's kind of a throwback to the old days, I think. Mm. I, I, I respectfully disagree f with that. Well, you have to be respectful about it. Oh, no, I, I, I'm talking to my writer. Are you kidding <laughs> no, me? No, no, you just say of you're course, crazy, man. No, I just don't agree with that one because you look at what's a technical foul now, right? Yeah. And, and granted, this particular series, I think Draymond alone – has gotten the attention uh, of fans and coaches and just the big picture of what's going on in the finals. But, man, I do you remember when the Lakers were playing Boston? I should know the year. I want to say it was in 90 I, – I, I'm sorry, in 87, 88, 85, yeah. maybe in 85. Yeah, yeah. And I'm not – don't quote me on it. But uh, Kurt Rambis had a wide-open layup. Wide open layup. He was going to the hole. Mm -hmm. Kevin McHale. I remember this. Pops up, yokes him out of the air. Yes. Right? Do you realize? I don't think anybody realized for that you would get a two, three game week suspension in the NBA. You know what happened? That technical foul, nobody kicked out, shoot your free throws, and we go on to whatever game is next. Yep. That kind of physicality ha has changed the game. The late David Stern, I thought, did a tremendous job from a from a business standpoint because people didn't back then. We there were wrestling matches, right? People pushing, people holding, people being physical, and I thought changing the narrative of that really helped the NBA because you come to a game, you want to see guys scoring, yeah. you want to see guys flying and shooting threes, and that's what the late David Stern turned this game into. And I just, I, I just don't think that we'll ever go back to that old style of basketball. No, it's three no, yeah, pointers. That's absolutely right. Yeah, three pointers are they, they rule right yeah. now. Yeah, I mean, like it was the equivalent of three yards in a cloud of dust right. almost back then. You <laughs> right, know? right. And yeah, they're never going back to that. Yeah. I mean, the way the game's played is, you know, partly due to the fact that that it's better for the league that way. But yeah, the other thing is. That's the way kids that are learning the game now are learning it. Good you know? point. Yes. They learn to shoot the three. You like it? Uh, do you yeah, like the I game do. today? I, I, I do. Yeah. I do. 
I mean, I think there is a certain skill level that appeals to me mm -hmm. because one of the few things I can do in the game of basketball a little bit mm -hmm. is shoot the three. So, there you go. Yeah, I can get my head <laughs> like, around that. I like it. I like it. <laughs> I, I I don't know. I um, Finals, I mean, obviously this time of the year is what it's all about. And, you know, Idoka, the, the coach for the Celtics, Came in from from San Antonio, been an assistant for a long time. Mm -hmm. Finally got his opportunity, and they were ready to get rid of him halfway through the season. Yeah, because Boston struggled so bad as a team. And I'm curious to how you view coaching. You know, you've seen the all-time greats: Dick Mata, Don Nelson, John McLeod. You know, some of the some of the old school coaches: Cotton Fitch, Simmons, Phoenix. Son's legendary coach, the late Cotton. And you see coaching now. How do you think coaching has changed in the NBA? Uh, I think it's changed quite a bit. Because when you mentioned Dick Mata and yeah. Bill Fitch. Yes. And guys like that who were around back then. Those were some pretty, or at least my impression was that those were some pretty Tough guys, pretty hard ass, tough mm. guys. I can say Dick is for sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. I mean, you, you probably got, you probably uh, I was his three o'clock this afternoon. Yeah, with yeah, stories I told about you. him. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, love gotta, the guy though. By the way. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, hey, I, I love him too. He he was he with, with us with the media. He was one of those guys who would always give you something you weren't expecting. Mm -hmm. You know. Like, you could ask him a question, and he would either answer it, or he might just take it and go somewhere else with it. And I always loved guys like that. Mm -hmm. And I thought he was a, a great coach, a great fit for the time. I didn't think he would be, but, but that was only because I didn't know much about him mm -hmm, when course. he got here. Yeah. But once here... Has a championship, by the way. Oh, yes. Yeah. does have a championship. Yeah. But once he got here, I saw that he was going to be the perfect guy to build the team up through the expansion years and at least get them good. And after that, you know, if he wins a championship here, that'd be great. But yeah, that never happened. But still, mm -hmm. his, his place in the history of this team is undeniable. No question. Let me ask you this. You, and this you, you'd be the perfect guy, Ryder, to ask. How do you think social media has changed sports overall? Wow. Um, probably what you should do there is take that question, drop the word sports, and put in this world. Great point. <laughs> yes. Uh, I don't know. There are so many people who are just slaves to it now, you know? So many people who are just so into social media there i really think one of the things that's that needs to be dealt with somehow is the fact that there are a lot of guys out there it seems to me that are more into that than they are into playing the game mm. you know they wh whatever feedback they get whatever approval or disapproval or whatever they get it comes from there it used to come from your coaches mm -hmm. and from your teammates Thanks. and from inside that room Facts. Yeah, from from facts. Now it comes from what some spare in in Pawtucket thinks of you and something he posts and the way people react to that. And you know, it it, it drives me crazy. But man, that's this world we live in, Harp. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, what do you think about it? How, you how, know, I have, I have my thoughts. I I, I think. Social media, there is a place for it right now because we're so, so advanced. You know, I remember a scouting report, just to get to my point, a scouting report used to be on paper. Now they do everything now on the computer. And that's, that's a part of social media. Like I, I used to read basic things about John Stockton as a point guard, about mm -hmm. Kevin Johnson as a point guard. I'd read... Little basic, uh, smart player, um, likes to go right, mediocre shooter, whatever the case might be on, on, on that guy. Now these guys, they have it right in the computer. And I see guys doing games now all over the, uh, all over the, uh, all over the, the world where they're sitting down with a player 
and they're on the computer. And that's, that's what they use now is the social media f- platform to do everything. And I personally, I think that's why the game is still so popular. Think if they were doing it the old fashioned way now, it, it just wouldn't make sense the, the, the way it, for it to be this way yeah. or the old way if in this time and era. Well, one thing's for sure, like it or not, it's here. Mm-hmm. And if you are going to play this game, if you're going to do what you do in this game, mm-hmm. I mean, heck, if you're going to do what I do, you've got to adjust to it. You've got to adjust to it. You've got to figure out, you know, how, first of all, how to work it mm. and what it all means for you and just how it fits into the world that you occupy. We've all got to adjust to it. It's here. It's not going anywhere. Facts. Football, basketball, baseball, hockey. How has it revolved, in your opinion? You've been around. You've watched the old Cowboys, the new Cowboys. You've watched the old Mavericks, the new Mavericks. The old Rangers, the new Rangers. Mm -hmm. In professional sports, how has it revolved? And what's the biggest difference, you think, then and now? When it comes to players, when it comes to organizations, when it comes to the way the game is played and the way people go about their business? Well, in the game of basketball, the way the game is played is certainly the biggest thing for me because we were just talking about how now it's all about the three-point shot. Mm-hmm. It's all about the pick and roll and all that kind of stuff. And, and you know, it used to be get the ball down low. Get mm-hmm. the ball to the big guy <laughs> down low. Get an right. easy bucket, you know? Certainly did. Now the three-point shot's an easy bucket. Yeah. So just get open. Find the open man, move the ball, and get it up there. Shoot it. Yeah. And if you miss, maybe you'll get the rebound and get to try it again. Um, football, I don't know. It's more wide open. More of, It's more of a passing game now, you know? I mean, heck, offensive linemen back then, they had to know how to pass block, but they also had to know how to run block Yeah. because the running game was still a big part of it. That's not so much the case anymore. Now, it's all about protecting the quarterback, protecting the passer for them. And that's, that kind of branches out to all over the game of football. You know, it's all, about, it's all about throwing the ball. You know, you don't, it's no longer three yards in a cloud of dust. And in baseball, oh, my God. Oh, man. Well, I'll play a little game, Mike, if you would. Um, your top five NBA players in the history of the game? Well, you got to have Bird and Magic in there because the two of them created an an era. Right. you got to have Kareem Abdul-Jabbar in there because in addition to being bigger... Why do you think he's so disrespected when it comes to the GOAT? I I think because people look at him and say, well, he's so much bigger than everybody else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was bigger than everybody else, but watch the guy play. Mm. Watch the guy play. Watch his athleticism. Watch the way he changed the game. Watch the innovator that he was. I'd have to have him in there for sure. That's three. You said Bird Magic. Um, and you threw Kareem right, I'm, in. I'm, I'm holding off for the one that sits at the top of it for me. Yes. Um, God, there are a lot. Is of he the goat? That guy that that's on your mind right this second. Yeah, yeah, he is. He's the GOAT. Yeah, no he, he, no question. Yep. You know, they throw LeBron out there. They throw a lot of different people out there. Yeah, I guess I'd have to go with LeBron because LeBron typifies more than anybody else for me the way the game is played right now. Well, wait a minute. Michael Jordan might have something to say about this. Yes. Can I have a tie? I can do whatever you want. You're my grinder. Okay, all right. <laughs> Give me both of those two. But at the top of it all for me was Will Chamberlain. Mm, forgotten uh, giant. I mean, people don't, they don't put Wilt on Mount Rushmore for whatever reason. Yeah. I, I, I was a basketball junkie growing up. And one of the reasons why I wanted to be in the NBA, seriously, Mike, was because of guys like Wilt Chamberlain, Jerry West, Walt Frazier, um, just guys that just, all right, throw Elgin Baylor in there. Baylor. I mean, guys that seem to be forgotten. So they picked the top 75 players this mm-hmm. year, right? 75th anniversary mm-hmm. of the NBA. And there were so many guys left off 
of that team, what, who stands out to you when it comes to old old school guys, guys in in, in that era that the game wasn't about about a uh, hundred million dollars. It was about guys playing for pride and just wanting to be the best. Yeah. Back then. Well, all of those guys and the you, ABA. I'm sorry, Mike. Yeah, all those guys that you mentioned for sure would belong in that conversation. Mm -hmm. um, there are some other ones for me. That Havlicek. Yeah, Havlicek is one. Yeah. Um, let's see, we already mentioned Larry Bird here. So we hadn't he, said Bill Russell. Yeah, Bill Russell. <laughs> if you're gonna More have championships Will, than anybody. Yeah, if you're going to have Will Chamberlain in there, you got to have Bill Russell in there because Bill Russell was Will Chamberlain's foil. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he was the one guy who gave Will real problems. Yes. But the thing, about, the thing about those two was that... Bill Russell was always on a great team. Will Chamberlain. Great point. Will Chamberlain rarely was until he got to the Lakers. And there was one year with the 76ers. And I'm reading this book about the uh, year of the 76ers in 1967. When Will was there and they finally got over the hump and won the NBA championship that year. And that was one of the greatest teams record-wise ever. I mean, they only lost, I don't know, 10, 12 games, right. something like that something all year. Something ridiculous, yeah. And Wilt had maybe his greatest year ever, but it was not his biggest scoring year. Mm -hmm. You know, Wilt averaged 50 points a game one year. But this year, he Wilt could do whatever he wanted to out there. The way he played was based pretty much on what he decided to do and mm -hmm. what somebody could talk him into doing. Mm-hmm. And they talked him into, look, don't worry so much about points this year. Pass the ball. Be, a facil be more of a facilitator. Mm -hmm. And whenever you threw down the gauntlet like that to Wilt, he'd take you up on it because mm -hmm. he loved being challenged. And he loved showing people that, see, you didn't think I could do this, and mm -hmm. I can. And that's, that was when he changed his game, and he led the 76ers to one of the greatest years any team has ever had. Now, it was mm -hmm. not a dynasty. Right. You know, because they didn't follow it up very well, or at least not that strongly the next year. Mm -hmm. But Wilt was, I mean, that's the thing about Wilt that won me over more than anything else. Because here were all these people saying that oh, all that guy can do is score. Well, number one, there's nothing wrong with that. Last time I looked, that was the name of the game. Yeah. But, number two, but number two, <laughs> because he wanted to, yeah. because he wanted to show those people that they were wrong. And Wilt was a really sensitive guy. Yes. I mean, he read and heard everything rabbit he said ears about him. Yeah, is he what did. Bob he had, Lanier used to say. Yes, he had <laughs> rabbit ears, and <laughs> it would really piss him off, you know? Right. And he'd get to the point to where, okay, I'm going to show these people. Mm -hmm. And that was really one of the things that drove him, mm. that drove him to to be what he was. So he would. Have, he, he's at the top of it for me because, number one, there was no nobody like him around. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Number two, he could change his game however he wanted and still be the best. And number three, if he would have wanted to play any other sport, he could have. Yeah. The guy was just a supreme freak and a supreme athlete. You know, you notice I'm talking about, we're talking about the old school. Yes. I'm an old school guy, and I think it's been forgotten just how the league didn't just become great. The league has been great. For a long, long time, if you would. I mean, just simply great. And you you talked about Magic and Bird. Were you a Magic guy or a Bird guy? Because those wars back then, they were special, special uh, matchups. And I don't uh, think the Derek, league... Derek, Derek, don't do that to oh, me. I, I have to <laughs> do it to don't you. Don't make me dead. People want to know. People, like, I, I argue with somebody that... <sighs> When it comes to winning, right, I, I, I argue this all the time. When it comes to winning, I'm just talking sheer win. Is is Luka better than Magic? It, it's yet to be, be seen. Yeah. You know, Luka is incredible, right, as a player. I mean, just great. Yeah, he is. His ability. But is he, will he ever become the kind of winner that Magic Johnson was? Will he ever become the kind of winner that Larry Bird was? One guy doesn't win, win a championship, but you have to have that guy. Luca's that guy. He is will, definitely that guy. Will he ever learn to be that kind of a leader? That's going to, to depend, if you ask me, entirely on circumstance. 
what people are able to put around him. Mm -hmm. They're going to have to figure out what are the right kind of guys to put around Luca. Mm -hmm. What do we need here? What kind of guy can play with him well? What kind of guy gets him? What kind of guy can read what he's thinking, read what he's about to do, have that kind of chemistry with Yes. Him. I mean, you, you know how that works. Of course. And I think that's going to be the thing that tells the tale on Luca. Now, it's just far, as far as ability, he's a shot maker like few that we've seen. Yes, so, you know? so true. He is a magician with the ball. He can get the ball to virtually anywhere on the floor at a given time. But for him, I think it's all going to come down to what you surround him and what he maybe surrounds himself with. Um, you say put you on the spot. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to continue to try to do that, Mike. Okay. I'm Dirk, for it, Derek. Dirk or Luca? I'd Game, to, okay, okay. production, okay. impact, all of those things is, is okay. the way I'm viewing it. I'm having to project a little bit mm -hmm. because we have the entirety of Dirk's career in behind just four us, years for Luca, and we're, we're yeah we're seeing Luca just break out. But I'd have to go with Luca mm. because especially long term. Yeah, especially especially long term. Yeah, if Luca stays here, his whole career, he'll have ever every record there is in Maverick history. Number one, number one, number one, number one. Yeah, he will. You know, I I I, I mean, you look at Luca, and Dirk was a decent rebounder. But Luca averages eight, nine rebounds a game since he's been in the league. Yeah. I have, you know, and I, I argue with people. I throw Mark Aguirre in, in the category of those guys, too. Boy, I would, too. Oh, I really yeah, do. Yeah, and, and, yeah. And, and he's a forgotten man yes. when it comes to, to the Mavericks history. But he I just think he was the first big star here. He was the first big star, but his numbers match Luca. They match. Dirk Nowitzki, they match everybody. Yeah. Why do you think Mark was so so uh, misunderstood? Um, Speaking of putting you on the spot. Yeah. <laughs> um, back then, there weren't too many guys around who knew how to play the media game. Mm. I mean, I think guys... You're who, talking players. Yeah. I think mm. guys who get to that place that you're talking that you're talking about here, mm -hmm. they're all guys who know how to play the media game. They're mm. all guys who know how to use the media. And back then, the media was viewed largely by a lot of you guys, I think, as a pain in the ass. Mm -hmm. You know, guys who were always around and didn't know the game. Looking always. for something. Yeah. They, yeah, they, yeah. Yeah, we were all looking for something. Yeah. I throw myself in there, too. We were all looking for something. And some of you guys had a little bit of an idea of how to do this. You did. Ugh, I learned. You, you learned. Yeah, you learned. <laughs> I mean, after drooling out the clock for crying out loud, I needed <laughs> yeah, the media. You, you know what I mean? Yeah, once that happens yeah. to you, you got to yeah. learn. Yeah, you had to learn. I'll never, like I told you this before when we were on our yeah, podcast, yeah. I will never forget yeah. you after the game, after that, when you were, you had the whole throng of media around your locker. And you were, you know, getting your stuff together, and finally you turned around and went, you guys want to talk to me? <laughs> <laughs> After a blunder, right? <laughs> that was great. <laughs> yeah. It was an honest mistake. Man, I, I came away from that say. saying, I like this guy. Yeah. I, I, you know, sometimes you put in sports and life, man, you put in a situation. I think I said this when we hung out a, a, a month and a half or so ago. Sometimes you're put in a position where there is nowhere to go. No. Right? You can't go right. There's media over there. You can't go can't go left. You can't go right. You can't go behind you. Your locker is back there. You certainly can't push through what's in front of you. So they call it facing the music. I had yes. to face the music. You did. Or disappear, right? Never be never be the player that that I wanted to be for 16 years in the league. So when you're put in that position, you don't have a choice. Yeah. Yeah, so like but, I said, you learn. But back to what we were talking about, you learned how to do that. Rolando Blackman was real good yeah, at it, too. Yeah, was smooth, yes. And there have been a few others came, come along that were pretty good at it. James Donaldson was good at yes, it. Yes, very articulate, smart yes, guy. Yes, smart yeah. guy. You know, yeah. he was a kind of the gentle giant. People looked at him, thought he was nothing but a big lug. But if you talk to James, 
you found that there was a lot going on there. Yes, and he was absolutely. A, he was another great guy. Mm -hmm. You guys knew how to do it, but it, it's it, it's a process of learning how to work the media, and um, I don't know, maybe not get them on your side, but get them to see what you're. Let them see what you're all about. Let them to let them see what your thought process is. Mm -hmm. And some guys want to do that. Some guys don't. You know. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm going to shift to something else really quick. Um, what was your initial thought? You know, Donnie, Rick Carlisle won a championship. Mm -hmm. And clearly, once you experience that, that's, that's the rabbit. That's your measuring stick. That's where you want to you wanna go. And, you know, once Donnie and, and, and Rick were let go a uh, little while back, the Mavericks had to find a different head coach. They had to uh, they have to had to start to rebuild and try to get things back on track, if you would. Mm -hmm. Were you surprised at the hire? Were you surprised that they went back to a guy that helped them win a championship and Jason Kidd, who I feel like did a phenomenal job this year as a coach? Phenomenal, because there were some red flags about Jay Kidd, right, mm -hmm. coming in as a coach based on his. Previous stops, yeah, Brooklyn, uh, Milwaukee. Yeah, he had had a couple of shots. Didn't some, have a lot of success. Didn't have a lot of success. So I'm wondering, Mike, what was your initial thought when they hired Jason Kidd? Well, because I, I know a lot of people that weren't happy about. Yeah, him. I don't know if I was happy or or what I was, leery. Uh, yeah, I, I was definitely leery about it. Yeah, because I remember him when he was a player. I remember how he was with us. And he was as condescending mm -hmm. and as dismissive mm -hmm. as he could possibly be. I, <laughs> I mean, love Jason. <laughs> he, he, he talked to us like he thought we were all idiots. Mm -hmm. You know, like he just didn't give a damn, didn't have time for us or anything. I mean, he'd do it, but it was only because he had to. Mm -hmm. I was a little bit leery on account of that. But I will give the guy his due. Number one, he seems to have changed a little bit mm -hmm. from that. Learn. Yeah, you learn. You change, yeah. but, you know, you grow. Yeah. You do so. Jason was a, a – people don't realize. A lot of, lot of people, fans, you know, around the Metroplex and, and, and throughout the NBA don't realize that he got a job as a head coach right after he retired. Yeah, he did. <laughs> that doesn't happen. No, that doesn't Very happen. often, so. And to your point about how he did here this year, man, he coached his ass off. Yes, he did. I mean, he every move he made was the right move. Mm -hmm. He's a basketball savant. Yes. Anyway, Hall of Famer. Yeah, and he sees the game in in an almost pop like way. Mm -hmm. You know, and I thought I I I don't think I liked the hire very much when it was first made. Mm -hmm. But now they knew what they were doing. They Nico they Harris, were, Michael Finley, those guys. I mean, Mark, of course, yeah. makes all the decisions around here. But Well, I don't know who advocated for him. I know Rick Carlisle did. Yes. And Carlisle is said to have, have as he and Cuban were ending their scene, yes. before he walked out the door, he said, you ought to hire Jason Kidd. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that was the thing that brought him into play, but boy, whatever it was, they got a Real. good one. You know the thing that stood out to me all year? How even kill, yeah. That Jason Kidd, he he stayed this yeah, year. Yeah, he did. He uh, had three texts the whole year, which is unheard of because eighty-two game season, you would think a guy would 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 have more than three texts as a head coach. I remember sitting down, Followell, um, our whole production crew, mm -hmm. all the guys. We sat down and had a meeting with Jason and Nico because obviously as a as a uh, as a new uh, a new start, you kind of want to get a feel what, what they're expecting from from us as the media, right? As, right. A, as, a, as a group that that actually uh, covers the team. And the first thing that Jason Kidd said, which I thought was keen, I, re I really did, was he didn't want everything to be about Luca. And that sounds kind of you know, like, what are you talking about? It is about Luka. Luka is the best, one of the top five players in the league. He's been all pro since he's been in the NBA, right, in some capacity. So it is about Luka. And then he went on to explain it. He went on to talk about how 
they wanted to build up some of their role players and give them confidence as players, mm -hmm. which I thought Jason did a tremendous job of. In turn, it allowed the Finney Smiths, the Maxi Klebers to, to, to feel good about themselves. And I think ultimately that's what carried them through the, through the season along with a shift in a defensive mindset. Yeah. That, you know, Dallas is one of the top defensive teams in the league, and you and I both know that hadn't been the case with this Mavericks team. So he preached that. He had a great feel for his personnel. I went to one practice uh, at the start of the season, during preseason in September when, when, when training camp starts. And the thing that stuck out to me was how, how Jason changed the culture from what it was to having fun. You know, guys were running around smiling, laughing, I think looking forward to going to work every day. Yeah. And I think that's, that's the biggest. man. Oh, it's extremely important, especially when you grow accustomed, in all due respect to Rick, and all due respect to Donnie, when you grow accustomed to something that's old and you need a change as an organization, you got to find that. You got to find that even keel and find that, 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 that click or that switch that you can turn on and things become a little bit better. And I think that's the biggest difference in this Maverick team from the year before to this past season. I thought they had a a great season. I don't think anybody when the season started, Mike, felt like the Mavericks were getting ready to go to the conference finals. I can't imagine it. How did they get there? How did they get to the to the conference finals? You tell me. Your thoughts. Chemistry. On the head. Chemistry. Yep. That's what it was. Nothing what? takes precedent over chemistry. Talk about chemistry, if you would. Well, I can't, <laughs> I can't believe me. Yeah. Because so much of the ticket, if I may transfer over yep. into my own experience, mm -hmm. so much of the success of the ticket came down to the chemistry that we built together. And you talk about guys who couldn't wait to get to work mm -hmm. every day. Mm-hmm. It's that way at the ticket. Yeah. I mean, we all could not wait to get up there and just see what everybody had, see what they yeah. were doing, see where yeah. they were at. Talk to your producer. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, just just talk to the other guys, you know? Mm -hmm. And when we all would do things where we would all hang out together, be at the Super Bowl or, or Cowboys training camp or whatever, that was the most fun of all. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, in the course of, of the na natural flow of things, you don't see each other every day. I mean, it was very normal for me to go a couple weeks without running into any of the musers. Because <laughs> we were on the afternoon, they were on the mornings. Right, and, you know, right, never right. the twain shall meet. Yeah. Well, put us out there in Cowboys training camp. We're around each other every day. We all catch up. Mm -hmm. We all do stuff together. And we just, you know, reconnect. And you figure out once again just why you're doing this, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And what you get out of it and why it means so much to you. And that all comes down to chemistry. And I know it's really hard to define. There are a lot of people out there going to be looking at this and saying, well, what does that mean exactly? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I, it's just, but, but I know when it's there and I know yeah. when it's not. I'll tell you what it means to me. Uh, it, it means to me that the continuity that Jason Kidd and his staff, and it's about everybody collectively, it's not about one or two people, the continuity that they build after a team that, you know, after after Donnie and, and, and Rick, they build the kind of continuity that says to me they're on to something. Yeah. That they can build. Yeah. You got to add some more pieces. I don't know what you think about what, what, what they need, but they need some more pieces. They definitely need some more pieces. Yeah. The continuity was so good this year. It took them to the conference final. Yeah. This, so, was a, th this was a team where the whole was greater than the sum of the parts. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. And that's what I would think of when I would watch Maxi Kleba mm -hmm. and Dorian Finney-Smith and Reggie Bullock and all these other guys <laughs> yeah. out there playing. A lot, a lot of no-name guys. Yeah, a lot of no-name guys, but they were effective. And you could tell that they were into it, and you could tell that they were, they were playing together. They played for each other. Yeah, and for each other. And yeah. you could tell that, there, that, that there, there is chemistry in play here, and it's mm -hmm. good chemistry. So... Um, do you think when you talk about coaching, you, you think about coaches that have won championships over and over and over again. Red Arback obviously comes to mind. He has the most wins of any 
head coach, had t- um, Pat Rowley, Phil Jackson, uh, just the all-time winning coaches. Pop, we talked about a little while ago. Mm-hmm. Do you feel like in any way that coaching is overrated? Because I do, to a certain extent. Yeah, to a certain extent. I think coach, the coach needs to have some sort of idea of how he thinks the game is going to go mm-hmm. on a given night. Mm-hmm. And he should be able to provide his guys with an if-then scenario. If this guy on the other team starts doing this and this, then this is what we do. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the same when, when they're on offense as well. Coaches have to do that. They have to be able to set the tone. They have to be able to have some idea of how they want their team to play in mind, and they got to get everybody else on board with that. Mm-hmm. It's a big job, man. There's a lot that goes into it. But that said, you and I both know this is a player's game. That's where I was going to go. Yeah. I, I, I completely agree with a lot of the stuff that you said, Mike. But then when I look at, I look at the all-time winning coaches, right? You, I, I said Red Arback, Coach Hall of Fame players, Bill Russell, Hondo Havlicek, um, not all of them in the top 75 players, but you can go down the list of coaches that have had the most success we could have coached those teams. And I've never seen myself a, a, as a coach, right? But we could have coached those teams. We could have added, you know, your significant, your significant other and mine. And they could have been assistant coaches on those teams. Scotty Pippen, Michael Jordan, mm-hmm. uh, Horace Grant, Paxson, those teams that were winning championships, surely Michael Jordan, the GOAT. But my point is that all great teams have great players. Magic, Kareem, Worthy, Byron Scott, Michael Cooper. How could they not be champions? Boston Celtics, Parrish, McHale, Larry Bird, Hall of Fame players. Yeah. So where in coaching, you need guys to, to, uh, to pull all of that together. Yeah. You need guys I, who know how to make it work. Yeah, no question about it. Which, which, you know, which, which, which arms to pull. You know, just I and and I. And this is in all due respect to coaching. You know, I mean the Pistons. I I, I left them out with Chuck Daly. Yeah, considered one of the great all time coaches, oh, especially no on doubt. the de- especially defensively. Chuck yeah. was all about the defensive end of the floor. But I just to your point, the last thing that you said was players win championships. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah, they, they, they win championships plain and simple, man. And I, I don't like to dis, disregard coaching. But if you have players, man, leadership and things like that, you're going to be successful. Yeah, and if you don't, you're not. You're not going to be successful. I mean, there are 30 teams in the NBA, right? And all of them, most of the teams that don't win, there are two left standing now. So we're going to know who's best shortly. Yeah. Steve Kerr. But then you also have a first-year coach in Edoba that coached on the pop, was mentored by pop, first year. He's in the finals. And the only reason why, in my opinion, is because he has the personnel to be there. So I, I argue with people, not argue, that, that's the wrong choice of words. I debate and discuss yes. with different people on that, on, on, on coaching being just a tad overrated. All right. Well, first of all, to get back to a point you just you made and then just blew right by, I could have seen you being a coach. I don't have the patience. Yeah, you're, you're for, for, for I, guys. I, I mean, as, as I've gotten to know you now, <laughs> for, for guys that are making a hundred million dollars a year, I know. I, I, it, I, as I've gotten to know you, in all due respect, I'm not. I'm not counting people money and, sure. and mad at it, but you know, I don't know if you're wired for it. Yeah, but it's hard. But back then, when you were a player, I mean, it seemed to seemed to me, and you were a point guard. Mm-hmm. That meant that to a to one degree or another. You had to be inside the coach's head. Mm-hmm. 
you had to go out there with an understanding of what he wanted you guys to do because you were going to be the guy that, that set it all up, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. But you had to know what he wanted, and you had to have some idea of how you were going to execute that. And that's the... I mean, it was almost like I could get in your head and see the gears turning along those right, lines. Right. You didn't go right. off on your own too much, right. you know? Right. You always tried to do that, and therefore... I've, I'm always looking out for the coach in waiting when I see a team or see a game or something yeah. like that. Guys yeah. that that just look like they might have that thing. Mm -hmm. And I thought you had a little bit of that thing in you. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. I just never really, uh, really wanted to go down that road for for different reasons. Well, yeah, you know, I mean, it's it's got to be something you got the stomach for the fight for. Yeah, yeah, and and it's more than a notion is all I'll say. And I think a lot of it depends on your personnel, what kind of, you gotta cater to to individuals a little bit too much. Yeah. You know, a coach could, Coach Monta used to jump me on a regular base and there was nothing I could do. Well, you were his point guard. Right, but there was nothing I could do, do but take it. Yeah. Guys don't have to take it like that anymore. Yeah. You know, you, you get in a guy's face right now and you may be the first one to be dismissed. Yeah. You mean depending on the player, depending on the circumstances and the uh and the, the exact thing that's going on, but I uh I am going to dive into a lot of different things. This was a uh a a a a a start for this and I just simply want you to know, man, that I I really appreciate you uh you sitting here discussing and and, and voicing your opinion about all the things that uh that that I think about when it comes to the NBA and things that happen in the NBA. Like I said, when you get a platform, you, you want to be versatile. So hopefully we can do this again and talk about some other things off the court. I'd love that. Yeah, off Dude, the court is, is where I, I want to go. I, Harp's court. You, you, you're the great Derek Harper. I'm here for you, they, whatever you thank want. You. I really appreciate that. And I, I think I speak for a lot of people when they say that they appreciate you. Well, a lot of yeah. people appreciate you. Yeah. And everybody so, needs to watch Harp's Court. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be a lot of fun. I'm going to go outside the box a little bit. For well, sure. What people want. Yeah, I think you're right. Until next time.